So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. So the way it works is raise interest rates, tighten money, reduce the balance sheet, et cetera, get unemployment up. It doesn't sound like a desirable goal, but that's, that's what it takes. And that's what happened in 1982. Get unemployment high enough so people are buying hamburger instead of steak. They're buying, you know, whatever is the least expensive thing on the shelf, day old bread instead of new bread, or they're not buying gasoline because they're not going to work, et cetera. That will bring prices down, but at a very high cost, which we, we just talked about, which is high unemployment and uh, lower productivity. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. debt it keeps going up. We haven't really talked about the debt. That part of it looks like 1981. But if you throw in a global financial crisis, then it starts to look more like 2008. Yeah, well, that's like a glacier. Uh, glaciers are extremely powerful, but they move extremely slowly. With some exceptions, but they, they kind of like, you know, an inch a year, a couple inches a year, but they, but they move mountains. I mean, they just, they create rivers, they create canyons, they move mountains. They're extremely powerful, but slow. That's a good metaphor for the impact of, of debt. And when I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but it applies to any country, I focus on the, the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. And a simple example, if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least to fall on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you know, you just write a check. It's no big deal. My point is you can't look at a $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not, unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The U.S. just hit uh, $31 trillion in uh, in national debt, that is national debt, almost all of it in the form of U.S. Treasury securities, uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly U.S. Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? Well, one way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a, a little over 130%. What was it in 1980 uh, when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? Um, the answer is 30%. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions, no big deal. 30% um, is comfortable. 50%, yeah, getting up there. Uh, Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and, uh, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Master's Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, that was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do, you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or, or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. If you, uh, you say, what's the critical threshold where, you know, water turns to steam or, you know, water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same. It's, it's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The, end, the, best, the, the best research says the answer is 90%. And this comes out of, you know, Ken Rogoff at uh, Harvard, also Carmen Reinhardt, who's now the uh, chief economist at the World Bank. But they've looked at uh, hundreds of cases over hundreds of years. And I like that because it's not just, you know, kind of cherry picking data. Uh, developed economies, developing economies, uh, economies that issue debt in their own currencies, ones that issue debt in other currencies, principally U.S. dollars, et cetera. So, you know, a wide variety of case studies. And they show that not, when you when your debt to GDP, GDP ratio goes over 90%, your, your multiplier of an additional debt, uh, of additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context, at, at 30%, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar 30 of growth. You know, assuming you spend it wisely, that's a, that's a big condition, but uh, you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar 30 of growth. Okay, the debt was productive if you if you put it to good use. Uh, but that that dollar 30 gets smaller and smaller. As you get close to 90%, it goes to a dollar 20, a dollar 10, a dollar five. Past 90%, you know, roughly, 
uh, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar and you only get 95 cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then 90% and 85%, et cetera. So 90% is the critical threshold. The U.S. is at 131%, highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, you know, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of uh, modern monetary theory. She's a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter that uh, yeah, she, they always point to Japan. Japan is at uh, 280%, um, way past any, any member of the peer group. Um, China is probably higher. China is a little more opaque because, well, because they are, but also they they don't have as much national debt. If you, if you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of, of provincial debt. And the banks, the banking system is is owned by the government or controlled by the government. So when you throw in when you throw in the bank debt, the state owned enterprises, the provincial debt and the and the government. So that's the real national debt. Kelton says, uh, Stephanie Kelton says, uh, it doesn't matter because um, you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentina and you borrow in dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have, you know, huge trade surpluses, which they don't. So they just default, you know, Argentina is a serial defaulter and everyone expects that. If you um, borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Uh, well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. Uh, what about uh, inflation or hyperinflation? Um, what about uh, the foreign exchange rate? Uh, you know, the exchange rate can collapse. And the, these modern monetary theorists um, show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. I mean, if it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning $1 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do. Um, and they, they don't, they're just not very knowledgeable about any of those things. But you can think of exchange rates as a conveyor belt. Exchange rates are one way the problems go from one country to another or good things can go from one country to another, uh, depending on whether your exchange rate is going up or down, the impact on terms of trade, et cetera. But they, they completely ignore all that. They also ignore the role of commercial banks. They, they just look at the Treasury and the Fed and look at money supply, but like kind of M0, but don't understand how commercial banks create M1 and they do their own thing. They're not uh, they're not on as short a leash as, as they seem to think. But but it, you know, if you read Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she says, well, we don't really need a bond market, U.S. bond market. Uh, we only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. Uh, but why, you know, why have, um, you know, he said, yeah, government spending. So the Treasury borrows money by issuing bonds, and then the Fed monetizes the bonds by buying the bonds, and that gives the Treasury the money to pay the bills, et cetera. She says, do away with all that. Just give the Fed, you know, wire instructions for Lockheed. And if you need five F-35 fighter jets, order them and just send the money right to Lockheed. Why do you need a bond market? I mean, she actually says that. So, okay, kind of, I mean, legally, that might be possible, but to suggest that you can do that without consequences is nonsense. And they say, what about inflation? Uh, well, she, their view is as long as there's excess capacity and unmet needs, et cetera, you know, you're not going to have inflation because there's a lot of slack in the economy. Well, that's a legitimate debate. But what they say when inflation happens, raise taxes. Um, and the, by the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes?